Hello, everybody. Welcome to the History Value Podcast. Your host, Jacob Berman. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Aaron Adair. And welcome back to your channel, Dr. Adair. And today, we're going to be talking about additional uh, claimed natural explanations for the Star of Bethlehem uh, mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew. Um, so, I'd like to start us off with this question. I remember uh, in your book, you actually uh, brought up Zachariah Sitchin a few times. Ancient aliens also came up a few times on the UFO hypothesis for the uh, Star of Bethlehem. Could you get into that? I'm glad we're starting with the most plausible explanation for the star right from the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, it's uh, been quite interesting, some of the things I've discovered with there. So if you peruse a little bit beyond the peer review scientific literature, you will find the other explanations out there. Hmm. Um, but strangely enough, besides a supernatural star, the most common explanation I think people might believe is the UFO one because it's the one featured on the show Ancient Aliens. It's been featured on that show a few times. Hmm. And considering that show has you know, usually a pretty stable viewing audience of at least a million on every new episode, and the number of people who have read my book is much less than a million. <laughs> uh, it's uh, plausible that uh, that actually might be the most common non-theistic explanation. Uh, and how it came about is a little bit weird because uh, in uh, the middle of the 20th century, uh, there were kind of two phenomena that were going in America. One was UFO cults, um, uh, various sorts. One of the famous ones was started by a guy by the name of George Adamansky, who basically said he um, was visited by aliens in the 1950s. Um, and those aliens happen to look like tall, white Norwegian men and women, uh, <laughs> because apparently Norwegians are perfect and they come from Venus or what have you. Uh, uh, I forget if he said they were Venusians or another planet, but either way, uh, cults around that time are starting up and uh, people are looking for whatever evidence they can to uh, promote these ideas. And uh, various groups are also trying to rationalize the Bible. We're saying, hey, all these supernatural things, maybe it's just high technology. Um, as the saying goes from um, Arthur C. Clarke in his uh, third law, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So that kind of thought process is there. But as I've also learned, there was another source of these ideas, Soviet propaganda. Mm. Literally, uh, uh, some of the uh, Western-facing media that the Russians were using was also promoting the idea that the Bible was actually full of uh, alien encounters to try to undermine religion. So you have two things going on in the West, people who are trying to rationalize religion and say it's real and it's aliens, and mm. the communists trying to come in and say religion is fake, it's aliens. <laughs> uh, and because a lot of the people who you know pick this stuff up are not doing it very carefully and basically just say it's real, it's aliens, and it doesn't matter what the source is, whether it's um, people claiming to have met Venusians or literal Soviet propaganda. It's all it's all good as long as it gets to the right uh, answer. It kind of reminds me of the claim that the eye of the sun or the, the sun disk, the Aten, depicted on a Egyptian relief of uh, Pharaoh Akhenaten depicted right next to it, uh, to it is uh, Nibiru. Some uh, actually mm -hmm. claim that, and. If I remember correctly, I think there are some that go as far as claiming Nibiru is is a star of Bethlehem. Yeah, there is a couple of books that have, like yeah, I said, either Nibiru um, or otherwise just the more blanket um, Planet X, mm -hmm. the undiscovered planet somehow um, either are being discovered in the sky. So there's a more rational version of this that some people proposed maybe there was an early discovery of the planet Uranus by mm. the Magi, and that's what they saw. And then more recently, some people have also said, no, no, it's Planet X and all the catastrophic stuff that goes with that, especially with, um, you mentioned Zechariah Sitchin, but perhaps even more, oh, I don't want to say more, but relatedly as well, Emmanuel Velikovsky um, and his know. ideas of uh, Jupiter shooting off a, um, a giant body that encounters Earth, causes all sorts of crazy stuff, including like the stories of the Old Testament of the Exodus and Joshua and all that stuff. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and eventually that body becomes the planet Venus. It's uh, astrophysically absurd, but uh, you know, <laughs> it's it's out there. And some people are saying, yeah, maybe that was the star of Bethlehem. Uh, all those proposals, of course, have the issue of one, uh, physically implausible to put it mildly, and secondly, doesn't describe what's going on anyways. And uh, let's just say this much: if 
it really was the case that in the year 5 BC, a giant planet was coming by uh, and was visible to the whole world. It should not have been just this one terse little reference in Matthew. It should have been, uh, you know, written by the Chinese annals, uh, Korean, uh, the Romans. It's like there were a lot of people around who would have noticed and said, that's at least worth writing down. <laughs> mm -hmm. I would think. Yeah. Uh, the aliens, on the other hand, you know, that's at least plausible insofar that um, it could explain why only the wise men see it, why only the magi see it. If it's an alien spacecraft and it's only like, you know, coming around where they're looking or it has a cloaking device, whatever technology we want to give them. And it can certainly, you know, move around the sky any way we want. Again, we're giving them pretty much infinite technology. So can it, you know, fit the motions of what the Bible describes? Yes, because we basically have just made a secular form of supernaturalism. Uh, but of course then, well, it fits the description. That must be it. That, or there's no other thing we should be considering. No prior plausibility that we need to consider at all. Nope, we're done, right? Okay, maybe we should be a little bit more plausible. <laughs> I really do hope that there are other civilizations out there. I've actually um, searched for them somewhat professionally. I was an intern at the SETI Institute when I was an undergrad. Mm -hmm. So I have personally used their telescopes and pointed them around hoping to pick up a signal. Um, not in the same sort of way that you see in the movie Contact where they're wearing <laughs> hear, uh, headphones and hoping for a right. signal. For one thing, they're listening to millions of channels at a time. So Jodie Foster would have had to wear like a million pairs of headphones to do that. Not comfortable to say the least, uh, but right. nonetheless, we haven't found any aliens. We don't even know if they exist. And space travel is hard because the one thing you learn in astronomy pretty quickly is space is big, like really big, like really, really big. <laughs> Think of the biggest thing you ever thought of. It's bigger than that. Right. And then whatever you just thought of right now, double that, still bigger than that. Right. And the fact of the matter is, even if you had amazing technology where you had a ship that could get to just about the speed of light, even the near star system in the uh, uh, Alpha Centauri, Proxima Centauri system, it would take you over four years to travel there. And we're not even considering the fuel cost, which would also be absolutely absurd because not only do you have to take the fuel with you to speed you up to that, but you also have to have the fuel to slow yourself down. No reason to get to Earth on your spaceship and then zip by uh, faster than you can blink. You need to uh, slow down and stop as well. And uh, once you actually put in just you know the basic physics we know, you realize, yeah, this is no easy task, even for an extremely advanced civilization. Right. Yep. And uh, yeah, Emmanuel Velikovsky, he's that guy that does the uh, electric universe stuff. Uh, the, 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 um... Yeah. So it, it, he. It's worth noting, first off, how he even gets to these ideas, because it's like, you know, one kind of crazy thing on top of another. So first off, just so our audience knows, Emmanuel Velikovsky, he was a Russian born psychologist, um, eventually moved to the U.S. Um, in fact, when he moved to the U.S., he lived in the Princeton area and became friends with Albert Einstein. They went on walks together. They were apparently pretty friendly. But uh, Velikovsky, what, because he came from the psychological background, uh, and his interest in mythology in the same sort of way like Carl Jung and Sigmund Freud were and trying to explain things based on, well, in the case of Freud, us wanting to have sex with things. <laughs> uh, he, he always trying to interpret in that sort of way and about the subconscious and what's the real uh, truth behind the myths of that. And he thought he was interpreting, especially like the myth of the birth of Athena out of the head of um, Zeus that this is actually encoding actual astronomical phenomena. Specifically, Athena was a body popping out of the planet Jupiter and then coming in and then doing a bunch of crazy stuff and eventually becoming our planet Venus. That was like his early proposal and he's basing it on his interpretation of myths, um, supposedly myths around the world, but primarily his interpretation of Greco-Roman myths. And uh, well, that's a very hard way to reconstruct astrophysical data. Um, and quite simply, his system does not work with the laws of physics as we know it. So basically, he has to reinvent his own version of gravity, which then he <laughs> tries to apply with a some idea of like the sun being an oversized capacitor or magnet of sorts, and then trying to explain, uh, at least to some degree, the motions of the heavenly bodies using electromagnetism versus Newtonian gravity. And I've noticed that um, in my research on the uh, electric universe movement, they are also very anachronistic. They think uh, they think chronology has been distorted. Similarly to Anatoly Flamenco, 
who claims that Jesus died a thousand years ago and the Crusades and the Trojan War are the same thing, and that and he goes as far as claiming the Kremlin is actually Jerusalem. <laughs> uh, just for clarity, he he's also an Electric uh, Universe proponent. Oh, that's not. I'm not surprised. <laughs> oh no, no, I'm asking you if he is. I, I don't know. <laughs> Oh, I don't think he, I don't know if he is, but, okay. but his, his research, I have to say, is like the, Anatoly's research is like the bottom of the barrel. I, I don't think of any, I, in my personal experience, I don't think I've seen anything worse than the guy claiming that Jerusalem is a Kremlin and the Trojan <laughs> War and the Crusades are the same event. I just, you know, I, I would say these things, um, you know, are scratching the bottom of the barrel. But then I find out there are people who are such conspiracy theorists. They're like, huh, you believe in barrels. Right. It, it, it's always possible to go lower, unfortunately. It, yeah, that's true. <laughs> it is. That, that, that's a sad thing. Um, what do you think about Frank Tipler's supernova hypothesis for the star of Bethlehem? All right. So, uh, so just to give the audience background, Frank Tipler is... Um, I think he might be retired now, but he's a uh, uh, physicist, particularly did a lot of work in general relativity. He actually figured out ways of um, building a time machine based on general relativity. Um, hmm. It's not something that we could ever construct. It's basically, uh, it's something called the Tipler cylinder. And it's a cylinder that would be, well, in physics parlance, very long in actuality, um, as big as a galaxy, all composed of copper, rotating at almost the speed of light and going on one end through the other, then it could act as a time machine. In other words, we ain't building it. Um, <laughs> it's just a fascinating solution. And, you know, he's an absolute genius when it comes to working with the equations of general relativity. I would never want to fight him on that. But when he comes into my house and starts talking about history um, or the history of astronomy and things like that, that's where he has uh, little to stand on. Uh, it's also worth noting, um, starting in the 90s, he started writing these books. One, the first one was called The Physics of Immortality. Mm. And then later, the physics of Christianity and arguing basically that uh, Christianity is the one true religion that's completely consistent with science. Um, and even where the science is inconsistent, it will eventually become consistent because he even argues that anything that goes against his view would be against the laws of physics. <laughs> uh, it, it, it gets very difficult and absurd. There was a review by uh, um, Lawrence Krauss about that book when it came out. And he said, I would call this nonsense, but that'd be an insult and nonsense. <laughs> um, so there's lots of things in his book that are crazy, including that Jesus's resurrection body was composed of neutrinos, which is why he could pass through walls because neutrinos almost completely don't interact with regular matter. Um, and that's also like he somehow was able to shoot like neutrino jets out of his body so he could walk on water. I'm not making this sort of stuff up. He has his own explanation for Jesus's um, virgin birth that he's a um, an XX male that basically some sort of uh, uh, there's. There's a lot. There's a lot. Okay. There's a reason it hasn't become mainstream Christianity as of yet. His Star of Bethlehem one is at least not at the same level of absurdity. But let me describe. His basic idea is this. Suppose there was a supernova specifically in the Andromeda galaxy. The Andromeda galaxy is um, another gigantic body. It's a, roughly the same size as the Milky Way. And if you look at this object, it is the most distant object you can see with the naked eye. Without a telescope, you can see this galaxy of um, hundreds of billions of stars. And his idea is if a supernova goes off in there and specifically the biggest possible supernova, I forget which exact label of hypernova he gives it. But if he says like, if we take the absolute theoretical maximum brightness, it would have been visible in the sky and it would have been directly overhead over Bethlehem. And therefore that's what Matthew is describing. That's the basic hypothesis, problems. Did anyone record a supernova in Andromeda? No. In fact, our earliest record of even anyone noticing Andromeda comes about a thousand years later. So no one's even talking about the Andromeda body, let alone a particular explosion in it. Uh, and also there's a lot of things in his calculations that I find to be uh, wrong. For example, uh, he uses older measurements for the distance between our galaxy and, and Andromeda. It's been something that we've actually been like uh, refining since the first measurements were done by Edwin Hubble back in the 1920s. And our more recent measurements put it further away, which would make the star dimmer. And then probably a little bit too dim. He doesn't consider, well, even if a light on its own is bright enough to be seen by the naked eye, if you take a light and you surround it by a million other lights, can you actually distinguish it? He doesn't check anything like that. 
There's also the issue that uh, galaxies are not like this clean thing, like space is filled with a lot of stuff like uh, gases and dust. Um, and this should be something that also blocks some of the light. He doesn't even consider that. So there are just good astrophysical reasons for thinking it wouldn't even be possible to see a supernova in the Andromeda galaxy. And historically, we've only ever seen one supernova in that galaxy, and it was only with a telescope. So his proposal requires a lot of hand-waving to even make it possible that something could have been seen. And again, does it actually fit the actual description? All it does is says the star was high up in the sky. Okay. Uh, does that describe the star going before the wise men? Not at all. Does it describe the star stopping? Doesn't even mention the word for stopping. Uh, it, you know, we have very few details from the Gospel of Matthew. And if you're only going to describe uh, a small fraction of them and leave the vast majority unexplained, you have a crappy explanation. <laughs> it looks like he's trying to create a natural explanation for every single thing in Jesus' yeah. life, practically. Oh, absolutely. Every single thing he will say is not only completely consistent with the laws of physics, but are required by the laws of physics. That like, quite literally, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, the universe would not exist. That's the sort of arguments he makes in his book. How, how could Jesus, how does he explain Jesus being, how does, how does his body become filled with neutrinos to begin with? To, for him to pass oh, not through. filled with neutrinos, actually becomes neutrinos. Okay. So there is a theoretical way of converting regular matter stuff that we know to neutrinos that can happen naturally, but it's at a rate that is so low, theoretically at least, that we've never actually even observed it. So uh -huh. ever seeing it at a macroscopic level would be just unheard of. Again, how does he get around it? His declaration that if it didn't happen, the universe wouldn't exist. How does he keep saying that? Well, you see, God is a trinity. And that is a trinity oh, here we go. of black hole singularities. The one <laughs> at the beginning of the universe, the one our entire universe currently is in, and then the final collapse of the universe. So it's one singularity in three forms. That's the trinity. Christianity is the only one with the trinity. Therefore, Christianity is true. If Christianity isn't true, there wouldn't be a singularity at the, end of the beginning of the universe, and the universe wouldn't exist. Therefore, Christianity must be true for the universe to exist. But don't, I but really wish I were making that up. <laughs> but doesn't the but don't the Hindus have a trinity? Brahma, Shiva, Vishnu? Or is, is... It depends on how you want to split those theological hairs. Um, more importantly, uh, there's two things when it comes to our cosmology that also just make the whole thing absurd. One, uh, our best models suggest the universe isn't going to collapse back into a singularity. Right now, our best models would say not only is the universe going to expand, it's going to expand and accelerate forever. It's never going to collapse back in. So Tipler also has to claim that those things are wrong. And in fact, somehow future civilizations will figure out a way to collapse the universe to make his theory right. He needs future aliens to fix his theory now. Uh, and also at the beginning of the universe, his claim that the universe started as a singularity, that is also um, old hat that no one in cosmology thinks that anymore because it's inconsistent with quantum mechanics. You only get this singularity, this point-like uh, uh, feature for the entire universe, literally the entire universe at a point, um, if you take general relativity to its complete conclusion, uh, conclusion, but not think there's any point that it ever breaks down. And most physicists, virtually all physicists will say, ignoring quantum mechanics is not a good choice. And we know at those levels, the two don't reconcile and we need a new theory of quantum gravity, which um, almost certainly will not have a singularity. So what makes him think, what, what made him think in the, to, to begin with that the universe started as a massive singularity instead of a big bang expansion explosion? Oh, well, well that, that's um, so the earliest models for the Big Bang basically has it starting from like when uh, George Demetra, uh, the first person to propose the idea, uh, he referred to it either as the cosmic age uh, or the primordial atom. Um, just basically when he discovered from Hubble's research that the universe was expanding, mm -hmm. just run the clock back and you realize everything must have come back. And if you do this with the equations of general relativity, everything comes back to one point. So mm -hmm. it is the natural conclusion from, um, from the equations of general relativity. And you only escape those conclusions if you say that this, uh, you only escape that conclusion if you also say there's another feature that we're not considering. And that feature is um, quantum field theory, which general relativity 
doesn't have any way of incorporating, at least its current version. Uh, if we ever get quantum gravity, and you know, really hope we do, because it will you know explain so much of the universe. Uh, more likely than not, it does not allow for singularities. That there is like a uh, a coarse grainness to space and time itself. Mm. So Brett Forsev asks, now that we have the multiverse concept, does he address that? Um, I don't remember if he brings it up at all. Mm. Um, and in fact, I imagine he wouldn't in part because for him to get his particular uh, view of the universe collapsing, I would at least initially guess he would have to deny inflation. So uh, for our viewers, uh, inflation is basically, um, you could say a bit of a modification to the original Big Bang theory. Um, mm. So the Big Bang pretty much explains things really well from um, the early universe to today and its expansion. But there's a few things that are a little bit weird that are explained by the idea that very early in the universe, the universe expanded at an exponential rate. Um, this was actually created by um, um, Alan Guth at MIT, who I've actually had the chance of meeting, which was you know, a very quick meeting, but you know, got to shake his hand and his hand knows more physics than I do. <laughs> Um, That's cool. Yeah. Uh, and one of the consequences of inflation is that it's inherently unstable, that uh, you basically will expect it to not inflate and create one universe, but basically um, it comes from like a sea of other universes that will all pop up and start expanding out. <clears throat> so without like artificially constraining it, inflation usually predicts um, a multiverse. Um, now, most cosmologists, I would say, you know, the, a good majority will say inflation is real because it explains a lot of the observational data. Um, but we don't yet have the definitive proof. We actually thought we did several years ago in certain measurements of the um, cosmic ray background and uh, the light there that we were expecting a particular kind of oscillation in that light. We thought we detected it. Um, and uh, when other researchers looked into it, said, no, it actually be, could be completely explained by just dust. Um, getting in the way of that light and uh, its current research to try to put more and more limits on it. So right now we don't have the definitive or the best um, evidence for it yet, but it explains features that no other model um, does very well. So uh, I think inflation is more likely true than not. And one of its implications is, yeah, there's lots of universes um, because Tipler thinks the universe is going to collapse and he must require different physics than that. I wouldn't be surprised if he also would deny inflation, but I'd have to ask him. I don't know for sure. So going back to Jesus uh, having neutrinos in his body, apparently, does he, does he, since he thinks that, so since he does believe in a trinity, does he, uh, does he explain that by, I'm assuming he explains that by saying Jesus is, Jesus is God and God is three singularities at, at the same time. So that's how Jesus, so Jesus was basically born with neutrinos in his body. Uh, I, I, so he basically takes the idea from Paul that the resurrected body is a completely different kind of body. It's not a flesh and blood. And then he takes that literally. He's like, okay, the flesh and blood body of Jesus becomes neutrino body. Oh, I see. Um, so this can explain, for example, in the Gospel of Luke, when Jesus is like, you know, passing through doors and things like that and just showing up. Well, if you were actually composed of neutrinos, walls would basically be nothing. You really would be a ghost. Um, uh, and again, I, I'm not, I should have not assume the audience knows uh, a neutrino is a kind of subatomic particle. They um, are usually produced um, in uh, nuclear um, decays and things like that, um, or nuclear fission and fusion. Neutrinos would be lost out. They are of extremely low mass. They have no electric charge. And because of that, they have almost no interaction with regular matter. Quite literally, you could take a neutrino, fling it through the entire Earth, and it wouldn't even notice the Earth was there. Uh, so quite literally, if you were composed of neutrinos, walking through walls would be no trouble at all. And could somebody, like, not just walls, but could somebody like walk through the Earth that because of the neutrino going through the Earth? Yeah, yeah. Uh, then, yeah, you would also have the issue of, well, then in that case, why doesn't Jesus, like, you know, fall through the earth because he's being forced down by gravity? I'd have to look and see if Frank also is going to explain that by neutrino propulsion, like literally shooting neutrinos out the bottom of his body as act to some level of propulsion, because he does use that to explain Jesus walking on water. But then, if he, okay, so would he fall through the water? 
What is that different? I, I, again, if he's actually like, you know, shooting off basically with neutrinos like rocket fuel, then okay. he'd be able to keep himself in place. Wow. That's a, that, uh, this, this comes off as somebody that's extremely desperate to vindicate every miracle <laughs> in, the, in the entire New Testament. <sighs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, like I say, um, I'm with Lawrence Krauss in this one. Yeah. If you called it nonsense, you'd be doing a disservice to nonsense. And how does he... So now I'm curious, what is this explanation for Jesus, like, feeding the multitude with two loaves of bread and a fish? Or... I don't know if he goes into that or not. And he might just, you know, go with some of the other explanations of, oh, uh, people um, already had the food with them. And when they saw Jesus bring out food, they all brought out their picnic baskets. Because that's how some people have explained it even before neutrino physics came along. Uh, uh, the oh. entire idea of explaining every single story in the Bible completely naturalistically was already in vogue among Bible scholars about 200 years ago. And uh, that really, you know, that paradigm collapsed starting in like the 1830s and is now exceedingly rare, um, at least as thoroughgoing as that. Um, I mean, the closest you'll get is, you know, the occasional Bible scholar suggesting the Soon hypothesis, like uh, Hugh Schoenfeld had done that. Um, but even that sort of rationalization for uh, the miracle stories is rare. Um, and yeah, you have to look pretty far and wide to find anyone trying to explain away the virgin birth in terms of uh, uh, things. So to also give an example, the sorts of ways the old school Bible scholars did this. There was a gentleman by the name of Heinrich Paulus. Uh, he's writing in the 1820s. Uh, and he's basically at like the high point of this entire movement in scholarship. So he's basing it a lot of previous other people's works. And the most famous or infamous example is given of Jesus's, uh, of his explanation of Jesus walking on water. So here's the story as it really went down. It's a dark and stormy night. And the disciples are on their boat and are lost in the storm and have completely lost their sense of direction. So much so they don't even realize they've actually beached on the shore. So as Jesus then is coming, walking to them as the storm is clearing, they think our Lord and Savior, he's clearing away the storm and he's walking on water. It was just a misunderstanding. Re rinse and repeat that strategy for everything in the New Testament. And that was Bible scholarship in the 1810s, 1820s. Mm. Brett Forsyth says, uh, this reminds me of the Star Trek Next Generation episode when the Federation goes to retrieve the antimatter cloaking device. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes, yes, yes. When they were trying uh, the, the face cloak and that uh, accident that took place. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. If anything, I thought they were going to bring up the other Star Trek episode uh, with uh, Ardra, person who's trying to intimidate this civilization saying, I'm your devil, come back. And what is she doing? She's using her technology, her cloaked ship, to like cause earthquakes and things like that to convince them, no, I'm your devil. Um, and you had a pact with the devil that uh, when I come back, you're going to give me all your stuff. Mm. Uh, yeah, so Gene Roddenberry, was that a Roddenberry episode that might be after he died? Uh, but either way, there's yeah Star Trek episode of people saying, yeah, religion, it's just this, uh, you know, crazy misunderstanding stuff that you can imitate with, temp uh, with sufficient technology. Yeah, and, and uh, I remember that yeah, we did that uh, back when we did the, uh, the 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 Ralph Ellis critique episode. I think there was something we didn't bring up. Ralph's claim that the uh, that Jesus he, he, he tries to explain he tries to do natural explanations too, and not only does he say Jesus about the cross and all that, but he also goes on to say that uh, Jesus did turn water into wine because he had a machine from Hieronym Alexandria. Or not. <laughs> right. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm trying to imagine what that would be like lugging that around through the Galilee. Uh, <laughs> sure, anything's possible, but considering we only get this sort of story from the last of the gospel, it's, and uh, it really looks like it's trying to go out of its way to make Jesus, you know, like the newer, better Dionysus, I would uh, first yeah, go through a literary route to explain it rather than that sort of trickery that only exists in the most theologically sophisticated gospel. <laughs> but uh, that's just me, you know, doing real Bible scholarship. Right. Let me see. Uh, now, uh, in your book, you also bring up the, uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this guy's last name right, but uh, uh, Heinrich Vogt, uh, 
he with his heliacal rising heliacal rising hypothesis for the star of Bethlehem. Ah, uh, ah, uh, yeah, uh, Heinrich Voigt. Um, uh. Yeah, he was yeah a, a German theologian at the turn of the twentieth century, basically, and um, one of the last major German theologians to also trying to argue some sort of naturalistic explanation for the star. Um, mm -hmm. So he comes up with the idea. Um, well, yeah, actually, I'm trying to remember if he came up with it or if it was a previous scholar, but he was a promoter of the idea that there's a particular phrase in the original Greek of the gospel. Uh, when it's describing the star in uh, verse two, it says the star is ente anatole. Um, and if you have your King James Bible, it translates that as in the east. If you get a more modern translation, it'll usually say at its rising. Um, now, why is there confusion? The word anatole um, means basically rising or rising place. Well, where do things rise in the sky? In the east. Uh, to show like that connection uh, to the Greeks, everything to the east, um, or like the country of the east was modern day Turkey. They call that region Anatolia, the Eastern land. So there's that sort of confusion, but uh, Voigt argues that it's actually an even more specific term. It is something called a heliacal rising. What is that besides a somewhat cool name? I mean, it sounds like, uh, the sort of adjective you say something's awesome. Man, that was heliacal. Uh, <laughs> but it's a scientific term that basically means the first time a star or planet rises on the eastern horizon just before the sun where you can see it. Mm. And he's then arguing, hey, this is a scientific astrological term. Heliacal risings are of particular interest to astrologers. They're usually, they'll say that when a star is rising heliacally, that's when it has like its strongest influence. Therefore, this must be what is being described by the Gospel of Matthew, because he's using this sort of terminology. Hmm. Now, um, this, of course, then goes down to questions of, well, what exemplars do we have in other literature? How well can we actually argue that? Only a few years after Voigt's book comes out, an article is published by the top scholar of ancient astrology at that time, a gentleman by the name of Franz Bull. And uh, Franz Bull and Franz Kumal, they um, worked a lot together for like collecting astrological literature, a lot of stuff related to Mithraism. So if your audience is familiar with Franz Kumal, uh, Bull and Kumal uh, worked together on a lot of projects. And Kumal, come, or sorry, um, Bull comes out with this article and basically says, guys, listen, stop it. <laughs> this, you can't claim this sort of thing means this very particular thing. There's no precedent for that. There's no... Uh, philological reason that you can argue that. Um, he actually calls it just straight up naive. Uh, <laughs> um, and when he also says like anyone else trying to like astrologically figure out when Jesus was born, it's like trying to solve the equation A equals X plus Y, where X and Y are unknown. Any algebra student knows that's not solvable. There's literally an infinite number of possibilities. What are you doing wasting your time? Bull makes that exact same mathematical argument. Guys, the number of ways that you could possibly even argue this are literally infinite. Let's stop wasting our time. By the way, the way the thing is described is like going out of its way to not fit uh, astrological literature. Um, let's move on. <laughs> on top of that, uh, your audience is probably also familiar um, with uh, 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 Albert Schweitzer, uh, famous for one uh, being a Nobel Peace Prize winner for his uh, amazing work in Africa for, um, you know, helping the impoverished there, and also for writing, in many ways, the most definitive book on the quest of the historical Jesus. First writes this back in the early 1900s, and later he comes out with a second edition because, you know, you got to get those book sales, but more importantly, to also say what the updates were at that time. And he goes after Voigt and others who were trying to argue this, and guys said, hey, this question was settled like 100 years ago. You guys are literally going backwards in time. The language that uh, Schweitzer uses against the Star of Bethlehem proponents is even harsher, far and away, than the language he uses for Christ mythesis in his own time. He at least looks at like people arguing that Jesus was a completely fictitious person as, you know, at least worth debating. The Star of Bethlehem as a uh, scientific object is like, guys, stop it. Just stop it. This is stupid. This is terrible. This is completely backward thinking. So just that contrast shows just how much this was out of the mainstream, even with hundred year old scholarship and a hundred years ago, scholarship wasn't nearly as good as it is now. And well, I would hope most scholars agree with me, the, you know, the rightest person that ever was. 
So I'm gonna uh, let me see. I'm gonna take a, I'm gonna take a look at the chat. Um, uh, uh, Yesser says I heard they are. Uh, there was a supernova in Coma Boralis constellation. Uh, in which year? Because um, he we, says probably tried... four four BCE in August. Ah, okay, okay, yeah, that is a hypothesis. So to give fuller background, uh, when we're trying to figure out what objects may have been in the sky, we have basically two ways of figuring that out. One is doing back calculations, knowing where the planets, the sun, the moon were in any given night. And we can reconstruct the night sky with extreme accuracy. We can be pretty darn sure where the planets were um, you know, in 5 BC on any given night in Jerusalem or in any other town, if we so prefer. What we can't predict are going to be the locations of various comets. Like if a new comet came in and it was just a one-time pass, we probably don't have the information to reconstruct its orbit and know where it was. And supernovae, um, exploding stars, uh, those we basically don't have any way of knowing if they happen outside of actually having a record. Um, now the Greeks, the Romans, the Babylonians, they have some records of comets and uh, these objects, but it's not the best. Our best records actually come from the Far East in the Chinese annals, um, that they will record a comet or a supernova in the sky um, they'll use different terminology, but if they see those sorts of new objects in the sky, they'll tend to record it, especially if it has some sort of uh, political importance. So if bad things are going on in the dynasty um, and there's a comet, they're going to definitely record that comet and say this is a sign for uh, things coming in. There, there's even a, uh, a saying in the um, uh, Book of Han, the Han Chu, uh, when you see a comet, it's sweeping out the old and bringing in the new. Uh, and that metaphor worked because the Chinese word for comet literally means broom star. So coming in and sweeping away the old. <laughs> uh, so we have in our records a few different objects that maybe fit the timeline for Jesus's birth. In 12 BC, we have um, Halley's Comet, but 12 BC is usually considered too early. In five and four BC, we have a two uh, other objects. The object in five BC, um, is described as a comet, it's described as having a tail. The object in 4 BC is more ambiguous. Um, it could be a comet, but it doesn't talk about its tail. And that could be because depending on when you're looking at it, if the comet's tail is pointing either directly at the earth or directly away, you're not going to see it. It's just gonna look like a shimmering light in the sky. So it's hard to distinguish uh, that between a comet and a supernova, which when it explodes will look just like a new bright star. So it's hard to tell what the 4 BC object might have been. We don't have enough details there. Now, the problem with the 4 BC object as a possible candidate is it comes too late to fit the Jesus timeline. Uh, Herod is dead before Passover in 4 BC, uh, based on our best reconstructions from Josephus. And this object is seen in like March or so of 4 BC. It's too late. It's already coming after Herod is dead, let alone giving enough time for the Magi to show up and uh, do the things they're said to have done in the story. That only leaves the object in 5 BC. It's described as a comet rather than a supernova. Strangely enough, some astronomers have actually tried arguing the 5 BC object and the 4 BC object are actually the same object. And even though they're both called comets, they'll say, no, the object was actually in 5 BC and it was a supernova. But the arguments mm. are highly tendentious. And not only were they refuted already in the scientific literature back in 1979, but no one has even tried to address the points brought up because uh, all the arguments were either wrong or very wrong, <laughs> to put it nicely. <laughs> um, so then the question is, all right, we can be sure that around the time that Jesus was supposed to have been born, according to the Gospel of Matthew, there was a comet in the sky. We have that confirmed. It's beyond you know reasonable doubt that there was some sort of comet seen in the sky. According to the Chinese records, it was there in the sky for 70 days. So it was you know, probably prominent enough to be noticed. So could a comet account for the star story as we have it? So the other problem, uh, and the reason people don't want to believe it's a comet is because there's almost universal belief in like all ancient cultures, comets are bad news. Um, when they come in, somebody is gonna die. Someone is in trouble. It is almost never the case. Someone looks at that and says, ah, good news, uh, a savior is born. 
It's more like, oh crap, the king is going to die. Oh crap, mm. we're going to have a war. There's going to be a famine. These are the sorts of things you find in Greek, Roman, Babylonian, Chinese annals over and over and over again. Uh, it's extremely rare that anyone ever said a comet was a good sign. And when they did, they had political reasons. Uh, we can go into examples if we want to. For sure. Okay. Probably the most prominent example of this is with actually Julius Caesar. Um, after he died and was turned into Caesar dressing, um, I'm sure that's how the Roman annals put it, uh, uh, they had uh, this massive set of games for him. And uh, during the games, people looked and saw that there was a new light in the sky. Now, at this time, there are basically two factions amongst the Romans, the pro-Caesarian and the anti-Caesarians, the ones who basically were with Caesar and his uh, basically his surviving family and friends and his assassins. And when this light is seen in the sky, pretty much right down political lines, people are interpreting it differently. Those who said um, it was a comet are trying to say it's bad news and uh, you know this is a terrible thing. These are being said by the anti-Caesarians. By the pro-Caesarians, they're like, no, it's a new star. In fact, it's Julius Caesar's uh, um, soul rising up into the heavens and just denying it's a comet altogether. Eventually, they'll change their tune, but it required a lot of work. So one of the anti-Caesarians, the ones who was prophesying doom because of this comet, was an Etruscan prophet. And according to our records, um, at least, he saw the comet, said, this is a sign of the 10th and final age. This is bad news, guys. I'm done. And um, committed suicide right in the Roman Forum. You don't do that if it's a good sign. <laughs> now, when you have a prophecy like that, the only way you can counter it is finding another prophet to reinterpret it for you. You need basically a Daniel for your Jeremiah to re-explain the old uh, prophecies. And lo and behold, we find out that the Sibyl of uh, Cumea, basically uh, south of Naples, uh, also described what this new age is. And it's the golden age, the age of the sun, and it's gonna be great times. And uh, uh, well, instead of it being a sign of doom and gloom, this new uh, comet in the sky is a sign of the coming great age. Um, now, uh, it's also worth noting, can you go and see this uh, Sybil, this prophetess? Probably not. She's not like the um, Oracle at Delphi where you go and meet and someone gets hopped up on fumes and then someone interprets. This was uh, the Cumaean Sybil was supposed to have been an immortal prophetess. And because she was also immortal, she continuously gets shorter and shorter over time. By the time uh, she's supposed to have been alive at this point, she's been alive for centuries and she's so small, small she lives in a glass bottle. So in other words, this isn't someone you go and meet and chat with. And our only sources for this are the pro Caesarians, like Virgil saying, um, the Cumaean Sybil says uh, it's a new golden age, uh, praise be, praise be. So it's, it's complete propaganda, a complete way of trying to reinterpret that common in the sky as a good sign when everyone knew better or um, everyone believed the same sort of things everyone else did about comets. That sort of post factum uh, reinterpretation is not what we see with the gospel story because the major are supposed to look and already know it's a good sign, not have like post factum reasons to try to reinterpret it as, oh, this is the sign of the Jewish Messiah, which also begs the question, why are Zoroastrian priests caring about a Jewish Messiah? You know, that question shouldn't be ignored either. <laughs> a while back, and this was like years ago, I heard of a I heard of a theory that Jesus is walking on water can be explained by uh, apparently and this guy I'm talking about thinks that Jesus was a sun god. So he says the sun being seen uh, over the water and the sun and the reflecting on water is Jesus walking on water. Uh, I at least see those things as very different because mm. at the very least I can reflect on water and no one thinks I'm a sun god. Mm -hmm. um, so that seems a stretch to put it lightly um, and also it doesn't fit other things like the calming of the storm and, uh, and the like that uh, yeah that, that requires um, more stretching than I think is uh, worth uh, entertaining unfortunately <laughs> if anyone else has any questions uh, feel free to put it in the chat guys um, to answer everyone's question, because I know mm. they want to ask it, how many copies of the book should you buy? Um, at least 10. 
Um, because the more copies you have, the faster you can read it. And if you don't believe me, do a scientific experiment, get 10 copies, have one open, see how quickly you read, then have two, then five, 10, see if there's a dose response. And if you find out it's wrong, guess what? You got nine great gifts for your family. That being said, guys, the links are in the description. Uh, so go check out his book. I recommend it. Of a Star of Bethlehem. It's on Amazon, available as a, in Kindle and paperback. So um, that being said, um, yeah, it seems like these different natural explanations can take different turns. Uh, one one guy combining combining unrealistic uh, supernatural miracles with uh, with reality in such a such a strange way, and uh, yeah. or, or somebody explaining the miracles by saying Jesus is a sun god. In other words, he didn't exist in that way. And, of course, that kind of involves people claiming Jesus is Horus and all those parallels that don't exist. Yeah, um, yeah. Because Horus, I mean, he doesn't die and rise again. At least I'm not aware of an Egyptian story where he does. He's um, Osiris, Osiris' his father does. Yeah, yeah, his father does, but uh, just because, you know, yeah, saying your dad did it doesn't mean you did it. Um, my dad <laughs> has done many things that I haven't. I've done things that my father hasn't. And no one confuses the two of us, even though most people i've had family telling me for a long time i look like my father that doesn't make mm. me my father <laughs> right yeah yeah it, it, i didn't it, i did infect i i wasn't infected ultimately by his sense of humor so i also tell the same sort of bad jokes <laughs> mm. there's something i was going to say it slipped my mind for a second um in the long run do you think that, like, what, what do you think is the most, here it is, okay. What do you think is the most probable explanation if, there, if, the, if the Star of Bethlehem was based on something? What do you think is prob most probably the case? Well, there are two routes I could think about how to answer that question. Mm -hmm. One is, is there any sort of possible naturalistic event in the skies that could have given basis to the story? Or the other way, did Matthew have any prior source? So mm -hmm. I can imagine answering that question in two ways, because if Matthew completely made it up, then that answers both those questions in the negative. But if Matthew did have a prior source of some sort, was it ultimately something astronomical or something even more completely different? So ultimately, it doesn't seem plausible that there's something naturalistic behind the story, because as it is described, it is trying to let go out of its way to make the star not something that fits with the laws of physics. It's trying to go out of its way to say, guys, this is not the normal processing of uh, events in the universe. It's something that is traveling in the wrong direction. It's hovering over particular houses. Uh, it is trying to be a supernatural GPS guiding object. And there's no way that someone confuses the normal night sky uh, objects with something like this. You just have to, you know, be a goat herder for five minutes, look at the night sky, see how it actually moves and realize nothing moves in the way the Star of Bethlehem is described. And no one has ever made that sort of mistake. Uh, no one tries like following individual stars in the sky to destinations. Uh, if you just look at a star and think that's going to get you to the airport, no. The, the best you could do is like say using the North Star to know what direction North is. But then that just means you know what direction North is. You still need to know where your destination is. You're just, you're just now oriented. You're not actually guided by any star in the sky. So ultimately, if you're trying to explain the narrative as we have it, there is nothing naturalistic that conforms with it other than alien spaceships, which are dubious for reasons we just talked about a bit before. Now, did Matthew have a prior source or did he completely make it up? This is something I'm currently trying to explore and want to publish on because there are some weird things um, when it comes to Jesus and stars. Namely, there are several different sources that say Jesus is a star. Uh, three times in the New Testament, Jesus is specifically called the morning star, twice in the book of Revelation, once in Second Peter. Um, in the uh, letter of, uh, of Ignatius to the Ephesians, he gives this star hymn, and it seems like he's describing Jesus as this brilliant star in the sky with all the other stars like dancing around him. Uh, all these sorts of narratives, and, and not to mention, there's also the general belief uh, amongst many 
um, Greeks and Jews, that the dead become stars. So is something like that going on there? And that might be a background that uh, Matthew is extracting from, some previous story of Jesus as a star, perhaps even after his resurrection, but then being placed in the birth story. That's something that I consider possible and I'm exploring and want to publish on. Uh, and that's, I think, the best case scenario that there's a pre mythian uh, version of this. But if mm. there is, it's even more supernatural, <laughs> not less. Um, Yester asks, uh, could the star be the grand conjunction of Saturn on Jupiter? I think we touched on that during the first show we did. The triple conjunction. Um, we did, but uh, I'll quickly say that um, mm. a few things that make that difficult. One is that a conjunction of planets is never called a singular star. The object in Matthew is just called a star, singular. If he meant a planet, to specify that, you would have to say what star. You would have to say this is the uh, Jupiter star, or I should say the uh, Zeus star, things like that. That's how you would distinguish that. Um, secondly, the conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn uh, back in 7 BCE, which is the uh, hypothesis that uh, is the one that usually gets the most talked about, those two planets were never really that close. Um, they were always at least like a degree apart. So you would never confuse the two objects as one. Um, and there's just really no evidence that uh, anyone would have thought that this meant uh, the coming of the Jewish king. Um, wow. We actually do know about an astrological theory um, that uses um, the conjunctions of Jupiter and Saturn. But what we also know says it doesn't fit this version. First off, that theory of what are called the great conjunctions only begins to exist in the um, late antique or medieval period. And the way it would describe it, and it would predict like the birth of great people or uh, the fall of great empires or things like that, we wouldn't actually look at the conjunctions in 7 BC, but we would actually look instead at conjunctions years earlier in 26 BC. Um, and we know this because uh, the first person to actually apply this theory was a Jewish astrologer by the name of Masha'Allah. Um, mm -hmm. He was uh, a major astrologer in the Islamic world. He actually was there literally for the founding of Baghdad. He actually drew up the horoscope for Baghdad to say, here's when we start building the place so it has the best astrological signs. He applied this uh, astrological theory to Jesus and he said, yeah, the conjunctions of Jesus that are of interest took place in 26 BCE, not 7 BCE. Um, later people then you know, tried choosing different ones closer to the time of Jesus, but it had to literally break the theory um, we also see other Jewish groups that also tried using the idea of the great conjunctions to predict the coming of the Messiah. And uh, they always come up with something different than what the Christians want. So uh, it's a late theory when it's applied, quote unquote, correctly, if, as much as you can apply an incorrect theory correctly. Um, it would not apply to the 7 BC conjunctions. And ultimately, those conjunctions just don't have the motions that fit the description of the, uh, the infancy gospel. Yes, sir, also says in the Gospel of Emmanuel, it says it was angels who took him up to heaven. Uh, could be them from the beginning. Mm. Uh, I don't know if you mean that literally or you're just trying to you're trying to just say that uh, as an allegory. Go, go ahead and answer that, uh, Dr. Yeah, Adair. well, um, one of the things that uh, has been noted, like, for example, Dale C. Allison uh, in one of his studies on Matthew, um, said that, you know, one possible thing of what Matthew might be describing is an angel because um, the stars were considered to be angelic beings in uh, mm. a lot of the uh, theology and mythology of that time. Uh, I mean, there's even plenty of Old Testament passages where the stars come down and fight like they're agents of God. Um, and the, the stars fighting in the heavens is actually something we find in a fair bit of Jewish apocalyptic literature. So the idea that the star is actually an angel could fit uh, contextually with that um, and of course, angels can move whatever way they want. They don't have to follow the laws of astrophysics. So it can fit in that sort of way. But since Matthew is not explicit that this is an angel, it's always called a star. In fact, it's specifically called his star, which would be a very weird designation to say it's his guardian angel when he's also supposed to be um, the ultimate angel come to earth to be sacrificed and then go back to heaven. Mm. Uh, so I say that is initially unlikely but um, it at least has much more cultural resonance than the other hypotheses that have been put out there. Uh, Brett Forsyth says, if Jesus was an angel, then it would be mandatory. He has a specific star. As the fallen angels are described as stars that fell from their fixed locations. 
well, if they fell from the sky, then they don't have a star in the sky anymore. They're mm. uh, here on Earth and uh, stuck with us. Um, but that could be a little bit confusing. And I can give an example of there being a star in the sky, but there's also the angel here on Earth. So there is a um, what is usually called a Jewish novel by the name of Joseph and Aseneth. Uh, it's supposed to be about the story of um, the, a woman by the name of Aseneth. She's a uh, Egyptian woman who basically falls completely in love with uh, Joseph the patriarch. And um, there's almost no description of her in the Old Testament. So this, this whole love story of how she basically, you know, converts to Judaism and things like that. And, you know, she goes into sackcloth. She like fasts for several days. And um, like on the last day of her fasting, she sees the morning star rising in the sky. And she says, oh, this is a great messenger. Um, and the word messenger is the same as angel in Greek. And then all of a sudden the sky like rips open right in front of the star. And then all of a sudden there's an angel like hovering right above her. Um, and then when that angel finally leaves, it pops back on a chariot and it runs like back to the dawn. So it looks like a star that either is or comes from the morning star um, and then uh, heads back. So that would be an example possibly of that sort of thing. But um, how much we can extract from the novel is a little bit hard to say. The, the, mm -hmm. And this definitely is not a fallen angel. Uh, the description of this being is that this was supposed to be like the leader of God's army in heaven. Uh, if you read that, you'd first think this is literally the Archangel Michael. Mm. It's, it's definitely not just, uh, you know, demon number seven. <laughs> John Greer, uh, thank you for the $20 super chat. He says, nothing in nature moves that way. Well, first off, through God, all things are possible. So jot that one down. <laughs> right. Which then, of course, means it's not a natural motion. If, if God has to kick it then it's not moving on its own volition. Uh, it's right. not moving on its own uh, uh, internal uh, laws and properties. So uh, I think he's being a little bit in jest, but uh, yeah, absolutely. It does yeah, not, he, nothing he a, naturally moves these ways. He had, a, <laughs> he had a laughing emoji at the end of that. <laughs> very well, very yeah, good. He was, yeah, look, he was just being funny. He's, he's, uh, he, he, he's donated to the channel uh, often. Excellent, excellent. And I do okay. appreciate that, John Gear. Thanks again. Hernan P Posada says, Quetzalcoatl is also the morning and evening star, Venus. Uh, yeah, my understanding, uh, I, I don't know that much about Maya myths and culture. Um, and that's in part because, um, one, uh, so much of our records have been destroyed, and two, mm -hmm. I haven't researched it very well. But yeah, it's my understanding that, yeah, that... Um, I don't think Quetzalcoatl was both the morning and evening star. I think in that version, Quetzalcoatl also has like a twin brother. So Quetzalcoatl is mm -hmm. the morning, his brother is the evening. Um, on the other hand, they could have also been merged because, uh, so everyone knows, the morning and evening star are actually the same object. It's the planet Venus. Mm -hmm. The only difference is if you see it rising in the east um, just before the sun, it's the morning star. The same object then you see setting in the west uh, right after sunset is the evening star. And apparently this was a discovery of early astronomers. Like it had to be figured out these two different objects were the same one. Uh, the Sumerians apparently figured that out. And um, so their goddess Inanna, um, later the Babylonian Ishtar, is both the morning and evening star and actually changes gender, whether it's in the morning or evening. Um, the Greeks, they had different gods for the two different stars. And it was only like during the times of like Plato when the Greeks were learning more from like the Babylonians. Like, oh, oh, those two objects are the same thing. Okay, uh, I guess we'll call it Aphrodite now. Quetzalcoatl's brother, uh, Zolotl, is the uh, is his twin brother, from what I remember in my uh, all my research in the Aztec uh, religion. And Quetzalcoatl is often, he appears to have been conflated with the Aztec morning star god, uh, Tahuscal Pantiquitl. And uh, Tahuscal Pantiquitl, he rebelled against the another sun god, Tuanatia. And Tonatia apparently aimed a ray of the sun at Tahusco Pantiquitl, and he turned into a frozen god. <laughs> I think the god's name is It's Papalotl, if I'm remembering correctly. He turns into that stone god. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, this is well outside of my uh, area of knowledge, so I uh, I can say nothing uh, yeah. for or against. But I, but, uh, I I'll just throw in that it kind of, the scenery kind of reminds me of the a lucifer versus yahweh thing going on in isaiah 
And yeah, there's uh, yeah, there's been a lot of argument about so in yeah in Isaiah fourteen twelve, uh, the you know, prophet Isaiah is referring to it sounds like the Babylonian king and calls you uh, calls him Hello Ben Shikar, uh, um, so which is often translated as Lucifer, son of morning. Mm -hmm. um, and and then this is then where many Christians then have pointed to uh, this is the story of the fall of Satan, the fall of um, Lucifer. Uh, and ultimately, what is actually uh, Isaiah riffing off? Because a lot of people said, like, what mythological background is this coming from? Because there's these, like, for example, there's the story of a different morning star in Greek myth who tries taking control of his father's solar chariot, completely loses control of it, almost destroys the world in the process. And Zeus, like, shoots a lightning bolt at him to knock him down and uh, kill him. And so that's the fall of the morning star there. Um, when, uh, not Marduk, but... Uh, when Baal dies in the Baal cycle, uh, I th one of his relatives, Altar, is supposed to like try to take the throne, take the, his place. And Altar is uh, like considered the morning star in that myth. But he says, um, I can't handle this. This is beyond my power. And so this is him mm -hmm. giving up authority. Some people look to that and say, because in the Isaiah passage, um, it's supposed to be the Babylonian king is so boastful, um, so proud of himself. He's saying, I'm going to become like a god and rule from... Uh, the celestial uh, temple in heaven and things like that. And God is like, no, you ain't. You're going to be thrown down. You're going to be in uh, Hades. Goodbye. <laughs> I want to make a side correction. Uh, the, the the God of Frost that I was talking about earlier that uh, is a transformed is uh, called it's um, Tlaco Uh That's the God I was talking about. I, mis I misremembered his name. Um, and he turned into that, and Charles Gomenikito turned into that god after his failed revolt against Tonatia, who is supposed to be the fifth son. I think there's another myth, if I remember, if I remember where it's a Hutzlopotl, uh, uh, the uh, uh, god of war of the Aztecs, is, the, uh, uh, is sometimes the fifth son. Probably suggestive that they thought that Tonotia might have been the same god as him, considering that they had that in common. Uh, Hutzlopotl, that's the name of the god of war. I uh, uh, just want to repeat that for those that didn't catch it. Um, and the Aztecs actually uh, worshipped him as a god of war, patron of the, of the people, something like that. Kind of like kind of like the Romans of Mars, mm -hmm. uh, as father of the people. Uh, Okay, guys, does anybody have any more questions for Dr. Adair? Okay, there's something here. Um, yes, sir, says, in astrology, Pisces is, hev is heavily tied to the astral world. In Islam, they say, jinns live in the unseen world. If Jesus did go to India, he would have learned about these principalities of demons as suras. Hmm. What do you think about that, Dr. Adair? I don't know anything about Pisces being particularly connected uh, to the astral world more or less than the other zodiacal signs. So that I would need to see some evidence for that. Uh, like, why would one uh, sign in astrology be more connected to the celestial than the others? I don't know. And of course, Jesus going to India, uh, well, that's its own can of worms that uh, uh, seems initially unlikely because... Uh, yeah, I, this yeah. Also, yeah, it ultimately goes with the argument to what degree uh, Buddhism, for example, influenced early Christianity, and the evidence I just don't see is all that significant. Um, so, uh, I do remember when I was researching this because when I was trying to look for like other parallels to the uh, Wiseman story or the Star of Bethlehem story with uh, stories about Buddha or Vishnu or other uh, Hindu or, Bab or uh, Buddhist uh, myths. Uh, I remember people trying, uh, one person tried to argue that the Therapeutae were ultimately a uh, Buddhist group because Therapeutae could be derived from Theravada, uh, Theravada mm -hmm. Buddhism, the oldest branch of uh, the religion. Um, and they tried to argue, well, maybe this letter became this letter in Greek and this one. Um, and I found that that argument didn't work for a few things. One, Therapeutae has um, this weird uh, vowel structure uh, called a diphthong, where you start with one vowel sound and you end with another one. For example, the word I, I start with I, and then I end with another vowel, that's a diphthong. Uh, Therapeute has that diphthong. Uh, Theravada 
does not. So I don't know how that works. And also we know the word therapeutic comes from older Greek. Plato was using it before because it just means um, like to take care of something. Like when we, our word therapy or a therapeutic, um, it comes from that origin. And it's yeah, ultimately a Greek origin. It doesn't require um, anyone traveling from India. And mind you, Plato was writing uh, like a century before the first Buddhist monks were supposed to have been coming to the West uh, under the uh, uh, assignments from King Ashoka of India. So mm -hmm. it doesn't have any plausibility with me. Yeah, uh, it kind of reminds me of the, not only of the, f the false parallels and zeitgeist between Krishna and Jesus, uh, because I, I think that... Uh, it just reminds me of similar, uh, over-exaggerated uh, parallels between uh, Hinduism and Christianity. Now there are some there are some genuine parallels, like in the Mahabharata, uh, and I'm, most of the audience probably doesn't even know about this god. There's a god called Karna. He's the son of the, of the sun god Surya, and Kunti, his mother, well, she's not his mother yet, but she would become his mother. Uh, from, my, from, my, from what I remember, she asks uh, Surya, actually, no, she makes a wish, but I remember, then Surya appears, and apparently, I don't remember exactly what she, what, what kind of wish she, she, uh, uh, she made, but Surya shows up, and he decides to impregnate her without having intercourse, so that, because she's about to, she's betrothed to her husband, or who would be her husband? I mean, and uh, he does that. He does his thing, and it's a miraculous birth. And Karna's born, so you got you got a virgin birth in there, but I'm pretty sure the similarity is there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and there's similar stories with the Buddha as well that he was also supposed to have a miraculous birth, uh, mm -hmm. and also be a a, a, wund, a wonder kid. The moment he uh, popped out of his mother, he's able to walk and speak, and flowers opened up for him. So. Yeah, these sorts of tropes are uh, nearly a human universal. The idea of unnatural births and being special um, right from your entry into the world. That seems to be a near human universal, um, which also means that there's no necessary genetic connection between Hinduism or Buddhism and Christianity. Mm -hmm. And uh, here's, a, here's, a, here's a false comparison image right here that all of you uh, should see. Uh, in which, in this image, the Egyptian god Serapis uh, is is being compared to Jesus. Uh, this is as a theory that's just going all over the internet. Uh, ha has been going on for a long time. Uh, that claims that uh, Jesus and Serapis are actually the same character. Uh, uh, Doctor Adair, are, are you familiar with this? Hear this only before. in the vague sense that uh, mm -hmm. uh, many others have tried to connect Jesus to you know most of the other um, uh, pagan gods. Yeah. You know, yeah. some connections are legitimate, other ones harder to say. And definitely, the idea of it being a copy paste is uh, implausible, just because how much purchase would that have with other Jews? You know, ultimately, Jesus is supposed to be the Jewish Messiah, but he's also an Egyptian god. That becomes initially confusing, and if anything. Uh, hard to pass off to, uh, you know, the earliest Christians who were Jewish. So mm -hmm. they could definitely be influenced by the sorts of stories that might have surrounded Serapis, but copy-paste uh, sort of thing, or just, you know, relabeling unlikely. And it's also worth noting, in terms of imagery, there are things that just don't connect. Um, the most common thing that I know about Serapis is that he basically has like a bucket on his head uh, mm -hmm. or a pot on his head. Um, while to get some of the visions of the earliest Christians, you might have to be a pothead. That is not quite the same thing. The book of Revelation might be explained that way, but otherwise, hmm. yeah, there's nothing in the iconography of Jesus that really matches uh, Serapis. Yeah, there's actually, there's another theory uh, that's that's running around out there. This, this, this is a really cringeworthy theory. And I think at some point, I'm thinking about doing a video on it. Uh, maybe you could, maybe you can join me if you want on the video because this is this is just this right here is a, a classic example as, as what Professor Bart Ehrman would say uh, making stuff up and this uh, in this video this guy claims that the Council of Nicaea 
derived Jesus, uh, the Constantinian conspiracy theory, that, con that con the Council of Nicaea created Christianity, which is heavily anachronistic. Uh, that apparently Jesus was originally the name of this uh, Ptolemaic Pharaoh, uh, Ptolemy the first, the first Soter, and uh, uh, that the Jesus character is based on Ptolemy Soter, and. I'm like, I don't know where you get that idea from. We don't have any texts. We don't have anything that Ptolemy was reimagined into a Greco Jewish superhero called Joshua. This doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if uh, Ptolemy uh, did the process of deifying himself because that was something very common um, right. after Alexander. Uh, the deification called the uh, cult of the uh, kings or emperors. Um, if Ptolemy the first did that himself, I don't know. And also the title Soter or Savior, um, I could see the connection there with Jesus, but that title is also extremely common. It's used right. for Zeus. It's used for Artemis. Uh, it, it, you know, basically anyone who did anything important was called a savior. That doesn't make them all Jesus. Yep. Kind of reminds me of somebody who goes into Josephus and says every Jesus in there is the same guy. <laughs> Even if their name isn't Jesus, it's actually Jesus. <laughs> There you go. Uh, Hernan says, Thomas and Bartholomew might have gone to India. Jesus, I doubt he did. Um, I just want to quickly toss in there that the, um, that the legends that those guys went to India are extremely late. Like just way after, mm -hmm. way after even the, the, the Gospel of John was written, way after the New Testament was finished getting written. This is, this is even after Mar uh, Marcion, for crying out loud. That guy's late in the game uh i don't think there's any reason I, I personally don't think there's any reason to give credence that any of these guys who uh, were preaching in judea would care to go to india i just don't see how that's relevant to their missionary activities yeah i would say that's only slightly more likely than bartholomew uh went to space and became the companion uh dog character <laughs> in space balls because <laughs> his name was bartholomew <laughs> so he went by barf. <laughs> why, why not? Um, uh, Brett Forsev says, it, he asks, is there any correlation to the Star of Bethlehem to the Tanakh or the Kabbalah? Uh, Kabbalah is really hard to study. Uh, it's diverse in all the different influence it has. The writings connected to it are very dispersed as well. They're not like canonized in any sort of way like the New Testament is, especially uh, then. And I believe the earliest forms of Kabbalah also only begin to originate sometime after the destruction of the temple. So probably too long after to be a significant influence on the gospel writers. Um, and at best, they would have absorbed the astrology systems of that time. Now we do know there were Jews in the first century that believed in astrology. We found in the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, evidence that they were using horoscopes or the equivalents of horoscopes in their sort of things. Um, not full-blown Kabbalah, at least, but you know they were trying to figure like, uh, if this star is here and you hear thunder, um, what does that mean? Or uh, when Mars is in this sign, uh, what will that do to the formation of a, uh, a baby's body and things like that? So they were... They, do, they knew about astrology. They were practicing astrology, at least to some degree. Um, other Jews found it completely anathema. That's what you usually find in the Talmud. Um, but specifically, Kabbalism, I think, is too late and too uh, difficult to show any genetic connection uh, to the star stories we have. It. Um, yes, sir, brings up the Shekana. Uh I meant Shekinah. Uh, mm. None Bill ever brings it to uh, Mazaroth. Uh, yeah, there's an etymology I've been I've seen on the internet from time to time that people claim that Nazareth is a derivative of uh, the Mazaroth, the, the 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 zodiac, the Hebrew word for zodiac, something like that. That's all the more complicated because uh, Mazareth is actually still somewhat uncertain mm. of its original meaning. Uh, so the term shows up in the book of Job when um, God is telling off Job and uh, he's like naming all these things about like things that he controls that Job doesn't. So that's why Job should shut up and be punished because that's what he deserves for not being God. 
you know, it, it's not a really good theological argument, honestly. But nonetheless, uh, the word Maseroth is used in there amongst other astronomical bodies. And there's been a lot of back and forth in Bible scholarship what it is, if it's the zodiac or if it's a particular constellation or star cluster. Um, I think the most recent book on this I was looking at was claiming it might be the Hyades, um, which is a mm -hmm. star cluster kind of like the Pleiades. Um, the argument was that actually uh, pretty much if you, uh, you know, they're based on their etymology, it made sense that these uh, four different constellations that were mentioned in that book of Job, they're all related to the coming of the rain in the Holy Land. And uh, well, the coming and goings of the rain is obviously very important and something that God was supposed to control according to that book. So that might be why those are chosen. But when you get to the Talmud, they are using the word uh, Maseroth or Mazel in a different way um, to show how different it is. If mm. you know any Hebrew, you probably know the phrase Mazel Tov. And that literally means good luck as in good astrological fortune. Uh, mm. It's, uh, you know, basically may the stars be in your favor. It's a, a rough way of trying to translate what Mazel Tov means. All right. Uh, is there anybody else has any more questions? Because I think we're about to wrap up here. Uh, now Bellera brings up a rain god. I'm not really sure what that has to do with this conversation right now. Uh, yeah, I only in so uh, far as uh, only in so far as like yeah. Yahweh can also bring thunder, so he's also a, a bit of a storm god. But uh, yeah, that's, that's the only thing I can think of. That's true. Um, well, and and uh, that being said, I I think we can stop here. So I want to thank everybody for. Uh, uh, tuning in tonight, uh, John Gear. I want to thank you once again for your donation. I much appreciate it. And I'll catch you guys tomorrow on uh, tomorrow's live stream. Uh, tomorrow's live stream, author Paul George will be joining us to talk about his argument for the late dating of Paul. Uh, I'll have the premiere schedule put up tonight so you guys can watch out for it. Thanks again. Hello viewers, thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron. And or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during a live stream. Thank you.